Hi, uh, Martin. I think your last name, this is going to be hard for me. I think Fierburg, is it, is it perfectly pronounced? Uh, close as uh, Fierburg. Ah, uh, Fierburg. Fierburg? Yeah. Wow. Fierburg, yes. Fierburg. That's the Dutch way of saying it. Yep. Fierburg. Fierburg? Is yeah. Per perfect now? Am I? Yeah, that's very good. Thank so you. so am, am, am I Dutch now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> very good. So uh, now back to the serious stuff. What was your first computer? My first computer was a Commodore 64. Um, and uh, I actually wrote this in, in the first book I wrote with Ben Evans, the well-grounded Java developer. In, in my foreword, I sort of mentioned uh, that my parents had, had bought this home one day. And my father didn't know much about computers, but he just guessed that there was going to be something about them which was going to be really important to the future of his children. Mm -hmm. um, and so he bought that home with you know some games and programming books, and uh, there the rest is history. Okay. So uh, what do you read first, the game or programming books? I actually read the programming book. Uh, I was pretty obsessed with Star Wars at the time, and the first programming book I had on its cover that you could program the opening scene to a Star Wars movie with the stars and the words coming towards you. And uh, that really intrigued me. And so that was the, the first thing I read and, and tried to code in basic. Okay. So uh, now Star Wars. Why, why are you were so impressed by Star Wars? Um, I guess guess the, la the, the, la the lasers and the spaceships. And I think when you were a child as well, the uh, very simple... Uh, ideas of, of good and bad. It, it's pretty, you know, it's early Star Wars was pretty black and white, um, not, not so many shades of grey, and I think that really appeals to a, to a child. Mm -hmm. um, interesting, because um, in, 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 in my case, it was uh, different, because if you remember back then, you know, most of the science fiction movies were just ridiculous. This was, uh, I mean, it, it was like not comparable to Star Wars. And Star Wars is a great mix of, you know, action, and it, it looks realistic, I mean, it is not realistic, but it leads, it looks like you know the real thing, and and this was mm -hmm. I was fascinated really by Star Wars. It was like you know, uh, completely different world for me back then as a kid. So it was like you know, com complete different different set I would say of of movies. We started very similar, you no know, progression like Matrix later was also you no. Know, it, it started a complete different way of you know how 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 movies look like back then. Yeah, no, definitely. It was, it was such a step change. And it's amazing when you look at even the original 1977 Star Wars, that yeah. it's, it still holds up. I mean, the special effects and stuff, that yeah. they, you know, they, they don't age that much. It's amazing. Yeah, I watched them uh, last year, actually, the first one, and it was still great. I, I thought, you know, it would it's going to be really bad, but it wasn't. It was actually a nice movie. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really cool. Cool. So now, um, I guess the book, Star Wars book, was about basic, right? So you had to program the opening uh, scene in BASIC. Yeah, that, that's right. And uh, that, that's when I had my first uh, love-hate relationship with the go-to statement. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, I, I can't remember how long the first program was. I mean, in those days, you just had to copy, copy very carefully from the book. And, you know, if there was a mistake in the book, you had to write a letter to, to the people and uh, get, get, get the answer. Um, or you had to try and obviously debug it yourself, which was also very, very tricky when you're first learning to yeah. code. But uh, yeah, but did it work? It, it, it certainly taught me. It, it did work. Um, unfortunately, the graphics processor on the Commodore 6, the very first Commodore sixty four wasn't as uh, strong as later models, and so the, the star fields, uh, I think the uh, the F FPS as they call it uh, for the gamers, was 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 very low. So it was very a very jerky scene. May, <laughs> so maybe FPS, you know, awesome. frames per minute, not per second. Th this is maybe yeah, it was, uh, exactly, very very much like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, what the actually difference in in, in were there actually differences in C64 in graphics? I was not aware of that. I thought it was the same hardware all, all the way. No, um, uh, in the later models, uh, I think when they put out the C128, if I remember, they also then, the, the C64 models, I believe, also had better graphics cards. Oh. Or maybe they just fixed fixed whatever the bug okay, was interesting. in the sort of first edition that they put out. I suspected you to having, you know, the uh, ZX Spectrum, uh, but uh, this was my first. And, and of course, C64 graphics were way better than the uh, uh, ZX but um, yeah, interesting. So, and, and then you kept programming or were back to gaming, you know, after you figure out the go-to statement. By the way, 
I was smarter. So I figured out that there is goes up. So uh, for me, goes up was not the solution to all problems. This was my, my first pattern. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, very nice. Very yeah. nice. I uh, like it. Um, no, yeah, a, mi- a mixture of both. Um, I would, uh, I definitely would get, uh, got more programming books from, from our local computer store and, and things and, uh, sort of learnt the basics of, you know, uh, obviously no, no such thing as real, real recursion in, in basic, but, uh, uh, certainly learnt, you know, looping and iterative and, and branching and, and some of the basics are around that. And, um, you know, obviously making your own little character walk around a screen and things that, 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 that's pretty cool. It's a good sense of achievements. Um, uh, unfortunately I did not learn to comment my code in my early years. So I was uh, a true, a true hacker, a couple of thousand lines of basic with, uh, with no indication of how any of it worked. Mm-hmm. So, um, I started with basic and there was the REM statement, REM. I had no idea what it is, but it's the actually comment. And my idea of programming was that I have put some ASCII art inside the RAM and expecting to something happens. You know, those were my very first, you know, it, of course, it always worked, but nothing happened. And uh, th- this was, uh, it was completely <laughs> frustrating experience. <laughs> so I could r- write it now all the time, whatever I liked, uh, but it never worked. So interesting. But um, you learn the for loops and if statements just of, for the sake of learning, or y- you wanted to imp- implement something else than, you know, Star Wars opening scene? Yeah, so there was a, a particular game on the Commodore 64 called uh, Jumpman. Uh, you, you played it with a joystick, um, and uh, it was a little bit, I, I guess, similar to kind of the early Donkey Kong uh, okay. type of games, where you'd have a, a character that would have to jump over things to not die, and click, you know, click things along the way, and climb up ladders and that sort of thing. So I, I was yeah, h- hoping I could try and recreate that. You know, of course, not knowing that that particular game was. You know, at the time, one of the most advanced things they'd okay. ever put out in the Commodore 64. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and I, I was never going to get close. <laughs> okay, but, but, but you <laughs> saw at least something something on the screen, or was it it didn't work at all? Yeah, no, I certainly got something on the screen, uh, but I, I, I certainly couldn't understand how to, at the time, how to get the interaction with the joystick to work. So it was, yeah. uh, I, I had to move my, my person via the keyboard at the time. Yeah. Okay, So and, and what happened then? So you st- you kept you know hacking with C sixty four. You got your next machine. So what what was what what you did back then? Oh uh, well, my C sixty four I got when I think I was around ten nine ten years old, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. I was quite young, um, and so I didn't really go back to programming too much. Um, you know, a little bit at at school, but they didn't really have computing at school in New Zealand at the time. Not not a lot of it, um, and so. I think yeah, it was it was really at the end of high school. I'm just trying to think what I what I did there. I remember the being on the early apples, the early the very early Ma- Apple Macintoshes. Um, why that? Because you wanted to program but, something, or why you got the Apple? Just because you got it, or you wanted to to do something particular with the Apple? No, so so I uh, yeah, so I I didn't personally have the Apple. The apples were at school because okay. Apple was was big in education then. Um, and I remember doing a little bit of coding around, uh, I think the early calculator pr- program, uh, early ah. sort of uh, spreadsheet, spreadsheet type program. Okay. I, I do, I do remember doing, doing that to try and help myself and some other children with, with some math that I was, I was tutoring, uh, younger folks and, and, and just, you know, very basic math arithmetic type stuff. Um, so, so, so you enjoyed math? Yeah, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed early math. Um, I really enjoyed statistics as well. Um, when I hit calculus at high school, that's when I realised math was actually hard. Okay. <laughs> and my enthusiasm for it wait, wait, waned a little bit. <clears throat> it was it was such a different style of mathematics than I'd ever seen before, and it, it really took me quite a long time to get get my head around the basics of it. So that, that's when I decided that math, math probably wasn't going to be my career. Okay, interesting, because um, I, I learned also programming early, and I was absolutely not interested in math. For me, it was like, a, I don't know, uh, pointless. <laughs> if you know programming, you know, yeah. who cares about math? And then calculus, for me, it was like cheating. So for me, it's just, you know, this is not like, you know, something hard. It's like approximation of something. And I say, okay, let's computer do it. So for me, it was why I have to learn this stuff, you know, because uh, it is like I didn't like it at all. So the entire I got the calculus. But uh, uh, for me, I, I mean, I got it. I understood the principle, 
but it was like I didn't like that at all. So for me, it was like you know something like approximation of of, of an idea. And for for me, ma math had to be precise or not at all. Right now, I'm more interested. So I would probably would like to relearn it again, but I have no time at all. But this would be fun, you know, to to learn calculus again. Yeah, no, definitely. It's 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 you know, it was really one of the big academic challenges I had when when I was studying, and so I also would like to go back to, it, especially if I ever do go back to doing uh, postgraduate computer science. Um, you know, I, I did manage to get through my courses in calculus and things at university, but I, I never. I never excelled at it, and I was never comfortable with it. And so it would, mm -hmm. it would be interesting for me to go back after you know twenty five years or so, yeah. uh, and see and 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 see if uh, you know see if I, I remember anything, and see if I've learned other things in my life that that would make studying that easier. Mm -hmm. So you studied ma math uh, at university. I studied uh, three uh, three uh, topics. Uh, computer science was one of them. Okay. Uh, then I did a, a I did a business degree specializing in information systems. Wow. Um, which was all around, uh, yeah, sort of flows of information, understanding, you know, how, how factories worked, uh, all that kind of stuff. But also then in those days, starting to apply that to IT. Okay. Um, so that was, that was super interesting. Uh, obviously the two combined very well. Uh, and then I did a lot of psychology as well. Um, uh, up to about second year, I did a bunch of psychology papers and stuff. Um, trying to understand how humans work. Um, so, so you are a dan uh, dangerous man then? I mean, you know, you, you know computers and, uh, yeah, I mean? Yeah, well, no, as, 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 as it turns out, uh, we, we don't understand the brain all that well, right? Like neuroscience and things like that is, is such a it's such a young field. Um, and, you know, even, even the theories they've got coming out today are still, you know, still, still very easily challenged and things, so... Um, it's fascinating to study, but it's not not black and white like math or computer science. Okay, sure. so something interesting happened, uh, computer wise or programming wise, between you know high school and, and and university, or you just so what was the next programming language? This is what's interesting. So you started with basic. What was the next one? The next one, the next major one was uh, Pascal. Of course, uh, that mm -hmm. was the yeah, Pascal. That was the our programming language in the first year of computer science was was Pascal uh, and a little bit of uh, Visual Basic okay. uh, in the Information Systems course because we were dealing with Microsoft Access. Uh, so I learned those two, and then that's when the big wave of Java came in. The year after, so. When I started my second year of computer science, I was learning C and C++ in assembly mm -hmm. uh, for the various operating systems courses and things. But we also had a crash course, uh, a three-day course in Java. Okay. Uh, so, so us second-year students could then tutor the first-year students who were starting with Java for the first time, replacing Pascal. Okay. Um, and that's when I fell in love with Java because we had been, you know, for a whole semester, been, you know, you, you battle as you always do with C and C++, managing your own memory, mm -hmm. very carefully writing to hard disk. And if you get that wrong, you blow up hard disks. Um, and, you know, when Java came along and gave protections against that, but had a very similar programming model, um, you know, I think my entire year was like, yep, Java is definitely, definitely the way forward. Interesting. So for uh, for me, it was almost identical, except I really enjoyed C++, C in and C out. I read also the book from Björn Strustrup from Edison Wesley, and I really enjoyed the wow. ideas that you can overload everything. So I was, uh, it was hard, but I really, I, I, I liked that. And someone mentioned, uh, I, I remember that, it's like, you know, something new is coming up, um, and this is really object-oriented, and uh, it's going to be way better than C++. So, okay, if this is true, I will learn it right now, and this was Oak. And then it was uh, Java, of course. And then I started to learn Java, and uh, but I was completely disappointed because you know there was no headers, then there was no operator overloading, so the strange interfaces and and the entire idea of JVM for me was like cheating. It's like okay, it runs everywhere, but I have installed first you know <laughs> the program, then it runs. So for me, it was more like telling you know, Word runs everywhere, but I have to install the Word and then I can open the document. So for me, it was like you are all crazy. I don't know what you are doing, but um. But uh, I I don't know I stick I, I I ignored applets so I look at them but I, I said okay I will never manage to do something usable because the first applets were actually beautiful I don't know what they remember there was uh, one was like you know the uh, duke with the air hammer so it's just drilling mm -hmm. something and one was like particles which were uh, you can you can you can pull one particle and everything moved on screen so it was incredible back then this was a part of the initial JDK. And and for me, I look at that. It's okay. This is impossible for me. I'm not an artist, so I I don't know what uh, what to do with it. And then you know, 
servlets came uh, later, and then I stick with servlets and enterprise Java, whatever. So this was, but uh, at the beginning, I still like C++. If I had a little bit more time, I would do a little bit C++ or maybe Rust or something similar. But uh, but uh, the, interesting that you liked actually Java. For me, Java was terrible, and I never got the interfaces because for me, in C++, this was like clearly separ separate, you know, it was the, the header file and you had to load it and the Java was like, yeah, I have the interface, but it's still not as clean as in C++. This was my impression of Java, what I completely remember right now um, after, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, uh, there's good good comparisons. I, I remember Bjarni Strasov's book, uh, what, what a book that was, uh, yeah. you know, the, a, a real programmer's book that, uh, I'll say this kindly, it, it, it it didn't insult your intelligence. It made you. It made you work. <laughs> it, was, it was definitely not an introductory text to C plus plus. And I think all the subsequent editions, which I've I've bought for nostalgia reasons, uh, are, are also still pretty similar on that front. Um, okay. It's it's they're, they're they're not 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 for the not for the shy beginner. That's that's for sure. Um, yeah. No. Uh, Try to remember. Yeah. I, I I definitely did quite a lot of damage with with C plus plus. Um, uh, le less so with Java, although one of my rogue Java programs did take out the entire university network, which was, which oh, this was is interesting. Quite, quite so let's let's stick let's 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 cover this. So what was your you know uh, your trajectory with your first between your first Java program and your virus you wrote for the university? What I what I learned right now. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, we we started writing uh, you know very similar to what you're talking about with with applets and, and GUI style programming. So you, again, when you're teaching early stage students having something they can see is, is I think a good good teaching technique yeah. um, but then when second and third year we were doing operating systems courses networking courses mm -hmm. th those sorts of things so we were writing our first server-side applications you know write a very simple web server that can take a request mm -hmm. and send a response um, or uh, write a program that can you know uh, discover things on the network mm -hmm. And of course, it was my discovery algorithm, which had a bug, which had a memory leak in it. Okay. Um, so my, my my Java program would install a little Java program on every network uh, uh, port it could find, uh, but I had a memory leak in in there, and so that that Java program would just keep expanding, 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 and I didn't limit the size of the heap, and so I ended up filling up all the machines, <laughs> all the RAM of all the machines. How, how you managed to remotely install Java back then? Uh, so Java was already pre-installed on all okay. of the all of the, the machines we had, and so you know you could just connect to the whatever whatever Corba slash RMI port was was available ah. in those days. Um, yeah. But but the RMI was already running on all the machines, so you did so you implemented yeah. an agent basically, right? Which were huge yeah. back then. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So and and then what was you know um so, so then you became you know like a Java fanboy already, or you just programmed Java because you had to. No, no, I, I, yeah, I, I still really enjoyed um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the idea of, of, of object orientation now, uh, and I know Java isn't really pure in that, that aspect. You know, maybe small talk is, mm -hmm. is, is a little more pure. Um, but I thought it was a nice. Um, I thought it was a, thought Java had a nice compromise, right, between yeah. some OO ideas and some sort of pragmatic C C plus plus style, um, you know, imperative programming. Um, and yeah, obviously, just in the in the kind of business commercial world it really took off as as that you know mm -hmm. build web apps or build those very early web apps with a with a javascript or a, a, a visual basic six front end um type type language and so it was pretty clear leaving university that that was the language you needed to have to to sort of get into industry so, so you started to work during your university time with java commercially or yeah i did um a little a little bit of java still actually mainly C C plus plus. I, I was working for a company called chelma uh, they supported the New Zealand Stock Exchange um, oh. with both hard with both hardware and software. So uh, after my university courses, I would sometimes be crawling around uh, roof spaces, installing you know routers and networking equipment, um, or sometimes installing uh, software that would be that would support trading and, and things like that. Um, so that was still mainly C C plus plus, but a little bit of front end Java, so Java applets and things to sort of present financial data to, to customers. So there were serious pro programs back then. Uh, I was I was JDK one two, I suspect, right around. Yeah, it was JDK one two. Uh, JDK one one was the first one I used, but it wasn't really you know that wasn't really fit for purpose for for, for you know the serious language back then. I think that was still you know still very early days. But one two was you know solid enough to start using commercially. What I remember, I started with one one something, and then one one eight came out, and one one eight had the JIT, and I was delighted. 
it was so much better than everything uh, before. So uh, it, I had to, to wait a little bit longer, but it, the execution time was really fast. And by the way, mm. this Java was tiny back then. I remember the download size of the entire JDK was like, you know, five megs. And, um, and uh, it was so tiny that uh, we wrote commercial e-commerce software and uh, the entire system, CMS with Java, was around 10 megs. And I remember, like, you know, the marketing uh, guy came to me and, and told me, it, it doesn't look serious. So usually, you know, if you, if you install something from Oracle or the other companies, you know, the entire CD is full and we are shipping like 10 megs. And I said, okay, what I can do, we can may maybe add some video stuff or whatever, but I mean, this is all I can give you, you know, this is, <laughs> this is why, you know, the, the idea right now, is, someone tells me oh, Java is bloated, whatever, I remember this day, it's okay, this is interesting how, how you know, we are, we are talking in circles back and forth, and, uh, and yeah, but this is, this, the, the discussion with the CD, it was before DVD, DVDs even, so it was almost empty mm -hmm. with the entire system, right, um, and, and, and this was even J and Java web server, I don't know whether you remember from Sun, and JDK and our yeah. system was everything was on the disk and was still empty. So this was, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the management people were disappointed with uh, you no know, our engineering skills. Oh, I know, and it's amazing today when you think about um, you know using a framework like Spring Boot or Quarkus or something just to just to spin up just to spin up Hello World, right? <laughs> and you see the size of that thing; it is it is unbelievable. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure it's a good thing. I, I think we have at times lost the art of, uh, you know, writing concise and concise code that, that, that really performs well with the hardware it's running on. It's a bit of a shame. But it's coming back. Maybe we will have uh, time to, to talk about that. But uh, if you, for instance, run on Azure Functions in the more event-driven uh, way, you can ship Apojo. So uh, what, what, I, what I see already that in the you know, event-driven cloud stuff, we're just working with Pojos. So, so there is no mm -hmm. dependent injection, nothing. So it's like back to JDK 1.1 for me, which is great. And um, we use also Corcus, which, by the way, is uh, very well supported by Azure Functions as well. And uh, then I can have in a function uh, the entire app with dependency injection, and it starts very fast. So uh, Corcus does actually a great job to, uh, you know, to... Um, to strip down the dependencies. Uh, Spring Boot is a little bit larger, but another great framework is uh, Micronaut. It's also very similar to, yes. to Quarkus. So I would say uh, ex ex different ideas, the same result, you know, it's just highly optimized bytecode. But this should be, you know, a topic for the next time. So I'm more interested now about your uh, your uh, roof experience with New Zealand uh, Stock Exchange, what, uh, uh, what, what you told me. So this was your. So it seems like you were high performance, uh, always uh, in the high performance uh, side of Java, and I actually suspected you are from London for other reasons because I always uh, and, um, met you in London. I remember one Java user group or a conference, or whatever. So and you are from New Zealand, actually, right? Yeah. So uh, straight, slightly strange history. I was born in born in the Netherlands in Holland, so ah, that, okay. that's why I have 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 the Dutch name. Uh, moved to New Zealand with my family when I was almost five years old. Okay. Uh, and then lived in New Zealand uh, until I was in my uh, very early twenties, uh, okay. and then uh, and then did so. In New Zealand, you have this thing called the Overseas Experience, the OE. Uh, al almost every young New Zealander, you know, goes away for about two years, and, and in theory, comes back afterwards. Uh, but uh, you know, we we my, myself and my uh, my partner at the time now, my wife Kerry, uh, we uh, left New Zealand, and after our two year trip. We were in Ireland, I think, at the time, and then we thought, oh, we'll just try London next, and uh, yeah, here we are, 15 years, 15, 16 years later. Ah, okay. So uh, you said in theory, so is this common that the New Zealanders never come back? I mean, New Zealand is beautiful. Yeah, uh, it, it is actually increasingly common that, that some New Zealanders just love their experience overseas so much, they, they settle down in a, in, a, in a foreign country. So I think in New Zealand, there's about 5 million people that live there, and then there's another 1 million roughly New Zealand citizens or permanent residents that are actually living overseas. Okay. Interesting. So you didn't like the New Zealand or, I mean, why? No, no absolutely, absolutely love New Zealand. But I think the, the opportunities to do really meaningful world, world scale software development ah, okay. back in those days, you know, 20 years ago, that, that just wasn't available. Um, okay. it's, it's changed now, right? New Zealand's part of the, the global internet and there's lots of really important t tech companies in New Zealand. Um, and so you can do global work there. Um, but at, at the time, yeah, you, d you definitely had to go overseas. Okay. For that so it was business decision more or less, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what is the next company? So, so you work for the company as a freelancer or what's, what's the deal with the, you know, stock exchange gig? 
with Java. Yeah, so that that was that was just uh, during my university years. Right. Uh, after that, I worked for uh, companies such as AIG, the insurance company. I worked for several financial services companies in uh, London. Worked for a Japanese investment bank uh, called Mizuho. So always, uh, always uh, finance, right? And 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 uh, trading and stuff like that. Yeah, mostly. Uh, yeah, mostly finance trading. Um, typically, uh, what we would call uh, mi mi the middleware portion of that. So, uh, in the middle, middle office or back office, as opposed to the you know sitting next to the trader at the desk, mm -hmm. uh, which 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 was which is very high intensity. So I'm, I'm glad I avoided that. Uh, and so yeah, so my interest was really building large large scale systems that could you know uh, really deal with you know millions billions of messages. Uh, you know, tra transform them, calculate them, spit out, spit out answers to the other end uh, type stuff. So that was and, always my interest. And always Java. Yeah, actually, always Java, and yeah, on some systems, diving back into C plus plus if if need be. Yeah. So so um, and which middleware you used back then? So uh, was it the application servers or what do you use? Or you wrote your own middleware or? Yeah, co combination. It really depended which firm you were with. So you know, to begin with, it was a lot of uh, write write your own. Mm -hmm. um, then you know when WebLogic first came out, when it was BEA WebLogic, that was yeah. a bit of a game changer, and, and everybody kind of swapped swapped to that. Really, at the time, it sort of swept the industry. Um, so I use a lot of Web WebLogic. Uh, I, I even actually really of... like WebLogic. It was a great yeah. developer experience. Awesome. It was crazy fast. There was one jar, WebLogic jar, and uh, I think Thin Client WebLogic jar or something, and, and you were done. Yeah. It was actually back then. It it was huge. I really liked that. And then they became, you know, this was the version eight. I remember, and from mm -hmm. version eight later, it became more bloated. And I didn't got you know the ideas like why are you doing this? This is so crazy. And I don't know whether you remember in WebLogic eight, even the monitoring part was great in the console. So there was a graphical monitoring. You saw you know the transactions going on. You saw you know is the queue full or empty? You can you can, you, you, you actually observability was cutting edge yeah. back then. And automation. Yeah. You, you could automate the entire thing with Jython back then and with JMX. So I, I would say yeah. it was the best possible experience back then. And um, and uh, there was a JBoss, of course, but it, it was not comparable with WebLogic, right? It was open source, but uh, but from the developer experience, WebLogic was really, really good. Yeah, and, and I remember um, deploying WebLogic clusters and, and the session handling, it, it just worked, yeah. right? <laughs> it, was, it was, you know, it was almost like a piece of magic running. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was incredible, and and the BEA team were just so responsive to any issue or bug you raise. They had such a, a high uh, quali quality bar. Uh, I, mean, I remember always being very impressed with their support. Um, that they were absolutely fantastic. Uh, but yeah, they, then then of course JBoss being open yeah. source eventually caught up feature wise, yeah. and then yeah. I, I definitely ran a lot of JBoss EAP uh, as well. Okay, I didn't knew that. That you are, I, I actually thought that that you were just doing Java SE high performance Java SE and never did the Java E, but as, uh, sounds like you're also a backend guy, right? Java E and J2E. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot, lot of J2E. I remember the uh, e EJBs writing my five Java classes just to say hello world across. Yeah, a, across yeah five the... Java classes means that you introduced the business interface pattern. So you had, you know, the EJB remote home, then the uh, remote, then the interface. So there were, yeah, there were four. So the, five is already and the suspect. Local, lo uh, and local, oh, okay, and local, local, of course. Yeah, so there are yeah, the yeah, double yeah, yeah. double view EJB. Okay, nice. But um, EJB weren't back then. It was early. Uh, they were not complex. They were cumbersome, you know, to write all the pieces. So this was the problem. It's not like uh, it was uh, hard to learn. You have to remember, you know, to do everything correctly. And if it didn't work, do you get deployment error because it didn't compile? So this was, you know, the annoying part. Um, yeah. un until Java. One, three, and five came out with the new AGB. So you also used the newer stuff, or just you know the Java E five and Java six, or yeah, no, mostly actually J two E one four. Oh. Uh, sadly, so yeah, so I, I had a mostly painful experience with with Java okay. E. I only got to do a little bit of Java E six um, later on in my career, but uh, okay, yeah, but but by that stage, I had actually swapped to uh, to, to yeah to running. Um, I think I even might have started Jay Clarity at that point back in 2012. What you also yeah, what so. you also did, uh, I remember you 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 implement a high performance queuing system based on I remember uh, I forget, it's a great name like not Terminator but similar with a, with oh, a the, ring buffer. 
the disruptor. No, that that actually wasn't me. That was uh, no, yeah, that, that was called the disruptor. So that was uh, from the Almax Exchange in London. So that was oh. um, uh, Martin. Oh, why have I forgotten his last name? Okay, it was, so it wasn't me. It's uh, oh gosh, I can't believe I've forgotten his but last you name. You presented this, right? I, I've presented it on behalf of them because it was really a super interesting pattern. The disruptor yeah, pattern. Um, yeah, I remember this because I also look at that. It's like it's interesting, but I don't have such you know requirements. But this was disruptor was in, still interesting. So it was like a ring buffer, right, with byte array, and you are reading and and writing. So you go in circle, and then there is no garbage collector, which is a crazy idea. Oh, crazy, nice idea actually, working idea, right? Yeah. So so their idea really was to yeah have have no object allocation if at all possible, um, but still to have a you know a Java programming interface because at, at the time the whole industry only had Java programmers. Right? It was really hard for the exchange to, to hire C C plus plus programmers. Yeah. So um, that's the sl- solution they came up with. And I remember you, you presented the disruptor pattern, and then I was you know in stock backend Java E projects. I mean like. CRUD, master data management and stuff like that. And people came to me and they say, okay, we have to use Disruptor. I was like, why? Yeah, because they saw this at a conference. And I say, okay. And there was actually no point. We, we didn't have such such problems. You know, we had a, we had a Oracle backend database <laughs> and, and CRUD. And, and I mean, the database took, you know, two seconds to respond. And, and they wanted to introduce Disruptor uh, pattern, you know, in the front end to, to improve the performance. Like, we don't, I, I tried to explain, you know, we don't have a milliseconds problem. We have a completely different problems in the database. I don't, don't think Disruptor will help you, but I think Disruptor was implement uh, was used in Log4j, right? In one point of time, so they they added it to a logging framework, I think. Uh, I don't know if they added the entire Disruptor, but certainly the idea of ring buffer, yeah, was okay. was added. I think for log Log4j two, I think, because I remember Kirk Pepperdine working with them a little bit on that. So it was Martin Thompson. He was origi- he was, Martin Thompson. That's name. He he was the original author of of the Disruptor, um, and he still runs the mechanical sympathy mailing list. Huh. Which uh, it's 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 low volume, but very very deep thoughtful posts from from you know e- experts like himself around uh, how Java mm-hmm. runtimes and and languages actually push down on operating systems and push down on hardware, and so you get lots of really really interesting insights from that that mailing list. Yeah, uh, interesting. So and, and disruptor is still a thing, or is it became it disappeared in frameworks? I would say is. It's not used directly. Right? Yeah, no. As far as I know, it's still a thing. I'm pretty sure they still use it at, at Almax. Okay. Um, I I don't I don't know if it's I don't know if it's been successful in terms of you know getting out of the financial services domain all, all that much. Um, I, I have to go back and, and ask them to see how they're doing as an open source project. No, um, maybe I invite think, them to do my podcast. You know, so we'll you should. Uh, if, if you invite Martin, he would be a fantastic yeah. person to interview. So I'm already curious about his first computer. You know, regardless of what the disruptor does, he has to explain me first how he got programming. You know, let's see. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that would be great. Because <laughs> that's where um that's where Trisha G's uh, career started as well. Really, Java career started was at Almax, and she. She was working there with Martin Thompson. Um, okay, uh, and you also have Dave Farley, who came out of, who was partly there as well. So he's a, you know, wrote that famous CI uh, continuous integration continuous delivery book. Okay, um, uh, so yeah, lots of lots of pretty famous people coming out of Elmix. Interesting. So uh, now about J Clarity. So why you started it? How you got the idea? And, and what's about J Clarity? Yeah. So I I. Yeah. Sort of two things happened at roughly the same time period. It was a little bit hazy now, so a few years ago. But um, I met Kirk Pepperdine mm-hmm. uh, on the conference circuit several times, and you know I sat down with him one day for I oh, must have been at least a good half a day, where he walked me through how he did performance tuning and how he had a really you know systematic uh, approach, which he calls the Java Performance Diagnostic Model, um, and that's how he you know tuned. Uh, any Java system, no matter what it was, and it was completely agnostic to what the application was doing, and, and this really struck a nerve with me. I was like, oh, this is this is really cool because at the time I was working on increasingly large and complex Java systems, and the biggest headache was trying to figure out the performance issues in production. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it was it was a real, real big challenge, and you know, it was costing lots of time, lots of money. So once I learned that off him, I went and took his his actual course in it um which is a four-day course it's really intensive um and it's a really practical workshop as well and i came out of that and uh absolutely loved it and i asked him you know whether he would want uh you know some teaching assistance uh and i'll ha- happily you know just uh, assist him in, in teaching the course so i did that for a little bit with him and then um and then actually taught the course on my own a couple of times uh 
Uh, at the same time, I met Ben Evans in, in London. I, we, you know, we'd started the London Java community together, um, and we met at you know several unconferences there. Um, and he was talking about a really fascinating topic about you know JVM internals, uh, how class loaders worked, and how the how the, the JIT worked, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and so all three of us then got together and continued sort of teaching both Kirk's course and some of Ben's material around around the internals of JVM. Uh, and then the light bulb kind of hit. We're like, well, how, how do we scale ourselves? Yeah, how, how do we scale this idea? Because we keep going around, you know, customer by customer, conference talk by conference talk, teaching people how to do this stuff. But, oh, wait, Kirk's, Kirk's brain as such, or Kirk's methodology, it's, it's systematic, right? Well, we can turn this into software. Um, and, and that's kind of what, what, what started it. And it worked? It, it did work. The first iteration definitely did not work because we thought the the methodology we followed with was very was a decision tree, uh, and as it turns out, it's really a spider web decision matrix. Um, and so we we hired uh, a couple of folks, both who had PhDs in computer science and who were quite capable of uh, picking up and learning machine learning. And so John Oliver, who's now still with me at uh, Microsoft, actually he. Uh, he ran a whole bunch of different machine learning uh, algorithm experiments uh, when we had a whole bunch of different applications running on different bits of hardware and until we finally you know, cracked the code. Uh, and we ended up using this technique called random forests, which is people who do machine learning who are listening to this call. It's, it's a very common technique, as it, as it turns out. But it was that that, that really turned Kirk's um, methodology into something that was you know pretty concrete in, in software but uh, if you are using random forest is there methodology at all then or is it just you know what whatever machine learning decides to do so how much you know uh kirk's idea is still in the in the decisions involved you know yeah v v very much still in there because there are some uh, magic numbers uh, in the training sets Okay. Um, or, or, or some magic numbers in the, in the decision trees uh, as such that, that have to be allocated. And the, the basic idea is that you're looking at what the CPU is doing. Um, so you're always assuming you have a performance complaint that's at the heart of the, the, the idea. So it's, it's a user or someone is always complaining there is something wrong, so that you've got to start with that premise. Then you look at what the CPU is doing. Mm -hmm. And if it's busy, you're like, okay, well, what's what's making it busy? Is it the JVM itself? Is it garbage? Is it the garbage collection thread that's being too busy because there's so much garbage collection going on, or is it you know a hot code, or is it something something else? There's all these pathways you can explore with 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 the hot with the hot hot CPU, um, and there are thresholds that you look at which make you decide, okay, which which path should I go down quickly. Um, if the CPU is not busy, then you've got to figure out, well, why is it not busy? Are we waiting on an external queue? Are we waiting on an internal queue? Um, has the program got a deadlock or a live lock? Um, th these kind of things. Um, and, and that may all sound like real common sense, but there are so many interactions between the JVM and the, the operating system and hardware, and they both feed back into each other, mm -hmm. uh, that it's you can't just solve it with a, with a simple decision tree. I would say observing CPU is a novel approach because all the other profilers, they just look at Java, right? So I think you were one of the first who actually looked at the hardware, right? Yeah, very much so. This is what Kirk's always been, you know, teaching. And I think I think Brendan Gregg from Netflix, I think he he talks about something fairly similar. And if you were to talk to Martin Thompson, you know, and others mm -hmm. around the mechanical sympathy space, that they they would say the same thing. And it's actually the hardware that really matters because that's the resource that you get bottlenecked on yeah. at the end of the day. So. So the second version worked, and was it like a software I could install on my machine, or was it an agent? What was the JClarity experience? Yeah, so we, we had two bits of software. One was uh, Sensim, which was uh, just a garbage collection log analyzer. So that that, that did, did not have the machine learning in it, but it had a bunch of statistical techniques in it okay. to understand garbage collection and, and would give recommendations. So that, that, that was a pretty popular tool because, you know, at the time, Java memory was, was sort of dominating the performance problems space. Uh, the other tool was called Illuminate, uh, and that was a yeah, software as a service. So you would install a Java agent, or the Java agent, you know, <laughs> in those days was actually allowed to attach to the JVM. Oracle's stopping that now because um, of security concerns, which is fair enough. Uh, so yeah, so you'd install an agent on every running JVM that you had, and uh, that agent could be triggered if you had a performance complaint. And yeah, it would you know click click the key telemetry, run the machine learning, um, and then send a result back to uh, you know our service. Uh, we we could do aggregations and alerting and all that sort of APM stuff. Okay, and then then you saw you know the results in a, in a portal or a web page, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 
Uh, okay. It would be a nice, uh, well, I, I say a nice web page. It was designed by engineers. And <laughs> Okay. No, no. Fair enough. I mean, probably could look nicer, but you know. yeah. Yeah. Uh, some colors and diagrams, I would suspect, right? So. Yeah, exactly. And and the, the, the step change ahead, I, th I think we were the first in the industry to, to, to really produce this was, um, you know, a lot of APM tools at the time would, would give you the data, right? So you could see the graph of the CPU spiking, or you could see that, you know, you had lots of threads, but th there was never any under, uh, ne never really an attempt at doing the root cause analysis. Okay. Um, and so what Illuminate could do, for example, was something along the lines of, hey, it looks like your, uh, you know, your garbage collection is causing the JVM to pause. Well, what, what, why is that? Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, it's the Linux pages which have been misconfigured underneath the JVM, which is what's causing the garbage click to go slow. Okay. Uh, and so you could, you could do that extra level of, of digging deeper um, because the machine learning had that, that information from, from the hardware. It's very useful so, because so. usually you wouldn't have you know, this information as a Java developer or you wouldn't look at this it, it, at all because you would assume everything is configured perfectly, right? It, it, exactly. So I think a lot of Java developers had been taught that you just deploy Java on, on exactly. Linux and, and it just goes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, was it commercially successful? So you had some clients or you were just, you know... Yeah, well, commercially successful enough that Microsoft acquired us. So uh, <laughs> maybe yeah. you were lucky, you know. So uh, Microsoft acquired everything. So the the, the question is, uh... yeah, no, we we uh, we were we were definitely a break even slash profitable company towards the end. Um, you know, it's a typical Perfect. startup journey, right? You, you you spend spend way too much money up front and and try to to find real customers later on. Um, so you know, it, it wasn't a billion dollar unicorn or anything, any any stretch like that. Um, but yeah, it. it the, the software was proven it was successful enough that obviously you know Microsoft took interest in uh, burning money or burning time at the beginning so I mean did you just uh, bur bur burning time I mean we, we all used yeah, you know at the start we all used our sa we all used our savings right to, to yeah. do the startup and we, we didn't pay ourselves for yeah it exactly was, uh, very good mm -hmm. usual, usual story so uh, why Microsoft bought you? Two, two reasons, really. One was uh, definitely the software, right? So obviously Java on, on Azure is now a very big thing, uh, and Java observability in the cloud is uh, a very important topic. And so they were very interested in the memory analysis piece in Sensum and what Illuminate could, could bring to the table. Um, now, obviously, it's taking us time to integrate that all into the, the massive Azure stack. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, it's a big cloud environment, but we, we, are, we are actually getting, uh, getting there with those two products, uh, integrating that into Azure Monitor. Uh, and then the second piece was, you know, Jay Clarity had an outsized influence in, uh, in Adopt Open JDK and just the sort of Java ecosystem yeah. uh, in terms of thought leadership and things like that. And so I think Microsoft was interested in, bringing us on board so they could understand more about just how Java worked and how the Java community worked and things. So yeah, I, yeah this I'm was actually sure a, a, a perfect, you know, transaction for Microsoft because uh, I remember you, you were always behind, you know, adopt uh, OpenJDK and OpenJDK. I never understood why. I, I thought, I don't know why you are so behind uh, OpenJDK. I remember once I was Jax London, I think this was the conference. And um, mm -hmm. I spent some time, you know, with the expanding Java E and Lightweight and stuff. And you tried to compile OpenJDK. So there was a night session like uh, how to build OpenJDK from scratch. And I had a brief discussion yeah. with you. And I say, why are you doing this? I mean, uh, who cares whether you can compile it at the conference, uh, OpenJDK? I, I mean, uh, and uh, you were always, be, uh, you know, just looking at the source code, whether is this really open source? Can we build that? Which is very important. But for me back then, and even now, I'm, I'm so detached from that because I'm just using whatever my clients have, you know. If they are running a Zool system JDK, I pick that. I don't like to argue too much because then you are in politics. So, okay, if you have support with Azul, I pick Azul. Or I can, if they ask me, maybe GraalVM is, is cool or, or, or Red Hat or whatever. And if I run on Asia Cloud, I will always use whatever on Asia. I don't even think about introducing something else. On Amazon, I use Coretto, period, you know. So, yeah. But you were always behind, you know. And, and we had a brief conversation, and uh, this is what I remember vividly. So why... You were always ab about, you know, open JDK, uh, adopt JDK. Is it was it like uh, related to your business as well, or why, why you were? No, it was it was it was kind of separate. So, uh, in, in parallel of doing J Clarity, we, you know, the the London Java community re really took off as a Java user group, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the things that our membership was always frustrated about a little bit was that there, there didn't seem to be a developer voice at the the decision-making bodies that were in Java at the time. So if you were trying to influence a Java EE standard, 
you either had to be someone like yourself, Adam, who was who was so passionate and so enthusiastic that you could get yourself in as a spec lead or as an expert group member and actually truly as an individual. Um, but you know, you, you know yourself how much time and effort you spent yeah. in your career being able to, to have a seat at that table. Um, but for the average developer, they were sort of always given software and they never had any say in producing those APIs or standards. Um, so we got ourselves elected to the Java standards body <laughs> as a Java user group, which yeah. was really unusual. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where I decided to teach myself, okay, well, how is this stuff built? How is Java EE built? How are the specs done? How can we, how can we as a day-to-day -day developer actually have our voice heard and influence okay. it? Um, and that's when I learned about building Open JDK and, and understanding how that project worked and, and seeing how, again, the day-to-day the -day developer could, could influence it. Exactly, because you are also involved in MicroProfile, as I remember, right? The Java, uh, the London Java user group. We, we were in the early days, yeah. I think when, when Java EE uh, was effectively put down by, by Oracle, they said, look, we're not interested in, in continuing this as a, as a Oracle-led technology. Um, I think the ecosystem wasn't really sure what, what was going to be next. Was it going to be yeah. MicroProfile? Was it going to be Jakarta EE? Yeah. It was a bit unsure. And, and so we just hedged, to be blunt, we just hedged our bets and said, we're the London Java community needs to join all of those, uh, oh, okay. and again, again, have tried to have that developer voice in those uh, new standards bodies, almost yeah. right. Yeah. So, for for my observation, you were for me like a you know, crazy mercenary who never who never sleeps, you know. So because you were everywhere, so if something was open source, you were there and tried to influence that. I was like, but what you are doing is impossible to have that much time, you know, to 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 to. to but now I understand. Okay, with London Java user group, it is possible actually have behind. So okay, so it's like more like a hobby, or I mean, it should be that way, right? So you try to say, okay, I would like to influence the future of Java because it's important, and the uh, business wise. Okay, now I got you because it was really hard to decode for me. Who are you actually, <laughs> and why? Yeah, yeah. Why, why you are at the same time with Open JDK and Micro Profile? Because for me, it's not imaginable, you know, to be. Uh, to, to understand both deeply at the same time. So um, our open JDK is, uh, uh, I could, uh, I think it's really hard, you know, to contribute anything many, f oh, this was the next thing. I thought even if I would compile open JDK, I don't think I could actually contribute something meaningful, you know, because it is so uh, low level for a business developer like me. So I do spend in a month to understand, you know, what's the problem. And, and if I understand the problem, I will try to patch and I get, you know, 20, Answers from Oracle why it is a bad idea. Well, I had similar ex uh, <laughs> similar ideas, uh, similar experience from Java. E. So I thought, you know, I, I have now the greatest idea. And I remember back then, Marina Vatkina was one of the EGB spec leads, and I told her at that conference, you know, this is my idea. And she said, yes, if you will do this, you will break this and this and this and this. I said, okay, <laughs> come back. And yeah. <laughs> so they said, okay, and Open JDK is even even harder. And um, yeah, the one hour I got you. So um. Now you, you you told me Azure Monitor, so we could expect to have you know your work visible in Azure Monitor in one point of time. Yeah, with one point of time. So it, it won't it won't be in the same uh, form factor as you know if you were if you were a former JClarity customer or user, you, you won't see the same uh, user interface sure. yeah, uh, yeah. as such. But the 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 the, I, the IP uh, so to speak will be uh, integrated into into a, a, a so Azure Monitor is a really big umbrella of yeah. all of Azure's monitoring tools and logging tools and, and all those things but there is a, a subset of that called application insights which is effectively uh, Microsoft's uh, a, a APM tool uh, for lack of a better 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 framing um, and in the in the Java version of application insights that's where you'll see our technology slowly get integrated and okay. yeah I, I don't have concrete roadmaps yet um, but you yeah, know sure. you'll, you'll you'll see you know no. official communication will go out as, as it always does yeah sure 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 but uh, what is the official title at Microsoft now oh, it's a real mouthful um, I am a principal software engineering group manager which basically means I manage managers <laughs> Oh, is, is, this is for you. Well, this is terrible, right? Because if you have managed managers, there is no more Open JDK C code involved, or you have writing uh, okay. uh, low-level C plus plus code to manage the managers. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Well, I, t t to be fair, I, I stopped, you know, being a serious engineer or serious programmer probably when I started J Clarity, really, because okay. um, I, I, I started being the CTO for, for J Clarity, which okay. was. Uh, probably not the best fit, but we couldn't find the, the right right title for me <laughs> okay. at, at, at the time. 
Um, and so I was more of an engineering manager at J Clarity than I was really a, a true Silicon Valley CTO who was still, you know, writing code, okay. Okay. Um, so, so to speak. So I, I did write a bit of code for J Clarity, but not as much as the, the rest of the engineers. Uh, and then I uh, took over as CEO of J Clarity, and then I was yeah, purely a business leader at that point. So you know, sales, marketing, human oh, okay. resources, uh, all that kind of stuff. And you enjoyed that? And also, you know, pre- yeah, no, I, I do. Uh, I enjoy. Um, I, I think. You know, I, I had a good engineering career, and I was a, a I was a really solid engineer, and and um, you know wrote the books and did the talks and all that sort of stuff. But I also worked with engineers who were just uh, I don't like using that phrase ten x, but they were on a different level than me, right? Just so much better and so much more productive, and an absolute joy to work with as well. And I thought if I can work with lots of those types of people and un- unblock all their stuff they don't like. Um, you know, I think you you just see amazing things get built, uh, yeah. and so that that's really been my interest going forward. But I think it's always true. You know, uh, there's 10x engineer. If they are smart, they will find another 10x engineer, which is 10x better than they are, but more specialized. I would say this is always the case. Whatever you do, there's always better people than you are. I have no idea about marketing. It's maybe also true. No, there are better marketers than than, than you. Who who knows? Oh, yeah, I, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. Um, Nice. Uh, what I would like to suggest is that uh, I would like to reinvite you back to talk more specifically about Java and Microsoft, if you like. So, I mean, you know, today was like a you know, nice chat, but then uh, let's see what Microsoft does actually with Java. I'm really interested in Java and Microsoft in Asia. So, if you like, we can do it next year. Yeah, no, a- absolutely. I'd love to talk about the story. We're, we're very transparent that, you know, where Microsoft is uh, still, you know, I don't think it's new new to Java anymore, but it's it's still learning how to be a good community member and a good and a good yeah. citizen. Um, and and we're just really excited to have the opportunity. I mean, you, I've obviously personally got Microsoft's resources behind me, which are vast, right? Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's a really exciting time to try and make a difference. It's yeah, and, and for me, Microsoft is no kidding. It's like uh, some Microsystems back then for different reasons, but a very similar spirit. So uh, I like that, and I still remember you know the stickers: Microsoft loves Linux at Java One. And I say, yep. this is the best sticker ever because you no, know, back then everyone hated Microsoft and the Java one. Microsoft came in, they were nice with the stickers, and they say, okay, this is interesting. And the first thing I did, I I, I went to, um, I walked to the um, booth of uh, Microsoft, and and asked them, what's Linux? yeah, we like Linux, we like Java. I was like, what's wrong with you? I mean, are you Microsoft? Are you fake or whatever? And from then it it, it, it I mean, Visual Studio Code. I use it all the time with Java, and they contribute all the plugins. So if you take a look at you know, Visual Studio Code with Java, it is uh, implemented by Red Hat and and Microsoft, which is great. I mean, you know, 15 years ago it wouldn't be impossible. So yeah, yeah, no, it's it's a very different company to what yeah. it was uh, to even 10 years ago. Yeah. And you are working Microsoft, so it's interesting. So where people can find you on the internet? Uh, they can find me uh, on Twitter, on yep. LinkedIn. They can find me... Go with Twitter. Uh, Twitter GitHub, is nice. Git, Git, GitHub, yep. Um, so I've got a, a strange uh, handle on, on Twitter. It's uh, K-A-R-I-A-N-N-A. Uh, so it's a slightly unusual name, but you can obviously just search by my, my, my yep. usual name. So, and GitHub? Um, but yeah. And GitHub, same same handle. Um, yep. Or you can just go to the Eclipse Adoptium project or the Adopt Open JDK project, oh, okay. and you'll you'll, see, you'll 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 find me through there easily enough. I'm I'm re- I'm really interested. What do you store on GitHub these days? Because if you're not coding, I will expect to have a lot of PowerPoints. You know, stored on GitHub, right? <laughs> I, I I do I I do have uh, a lot of PowerPoints on my Microsoft OneDrive. Okay. Um, and yeah, I. I I, I I still dabble in code and build scripts and things at, at Adopt, but um, I I often do as much damage as I do good. So I think I think the project has uh, project and I have decided it's it's probably safer for me to stay awake going forward. It's called Agile. Okay. <laughs> yes, <that's right. laughs> Thank you. See you next time. Awesome. Thanks very much for your time. Awesome. Cheers.